Thank you so much, uh, Stanley. That was a, a episode of my uncle's life that I didn't know anything about, so I'm happy to uh, hear all of that and be educated about that. I'm uh, grateful to Paul and James and uh, to all of you for coming out on a Tuesday night to talk about nuclear weapons. Um, and uh, I uh, thought a lot about what I would say in a lecture such as this and uh, wanted to do something really different than uh, many of the lectures I've attended about nuclear weapons in the past. Um, something different uh, from the barrage of facts and figures and um, just sort of a, a, the information that comes at audiences uh, about these issues. And I also thought that an audience such as yourselves would actually probably know most of this stuff already, right? You know the list of nine countries uh, who possess nuclear weapons. France, China, the United Kingdom, India, Pakistan, Israel, North Korea, uh, in addition to the United States and Russia. You know that these nine countries together possess almost 15,000 nuclear weapons, give or take, and that the United States and Russia account for more than 90% of those weapons. You know all about, and it was already mentioned uh, here tonight, about the United States' plans to modernize our arsenal uh, to the tune of almost a half a trillion dollars over the next 10 years. And, uh, and I think you also know that, that while Donald Trump is more dangerous, uh, perhaps, than other presidents in his recklessness, his overriding need to win and to appear to win at all costs, you also know that every president of the nuclear age has played his own part uh, in extending the nuclear nightmare and increasing the threat of global annihilation. Right? So those are sort of the facts on the ground. And I could spend 45 minutes talking about those and unpacking those, talking about short range and long range missiles and where they are and all of that. Um, or I could tell a very different story. And, and so this is a story that I've chosen to tell. Uh, and it's sort of my own story, sort of the story of my family and, and all of the others who, um, who are, in a sense, uh, bucket brigading responsibility and sacrifice in an effort to douse the nuclear inferno. Um, and so I start with this, and I, uh, I kind of love the title that I came up with, and then I had to kind of figure out what to say about this title, right? Nuclear weapons ruined my life. So this is a story in six or seven episodes uh, uh, throughout my life. April 1st, 1974, uh, I am born, and it's a home birth to a nun and a priest in the basement of a tall three-story row house in Baltimore. And that row house is full of anti-nuclear activists. Uh, the day I'm born, uh, the bulletin of the atomic scientists' doomsday clock stands at 12 minutes to nuclear midnight. I'll take a moment and silence our cell phones. Um, it stands at 12 minutes to nuclear move, uh, midnight. And it was moved uh, back uh, in 1972, so it had been at 12 minutes for, for a couple years. It was moved back uh, after the United States and the Soviet Union signed uh, the SALT agreements. Um, but a few months after I'm born, the scientists move the clock forward, and they move it to nine minutes to nuclear midnight, in recognition that our hopes of awakening, of sanity, were premature, and that the danger of nuclear doomsday is uh, measurably greater today than it was in 1972. And this uh, doomsday clock will, uh, will, throughout my life, of course, I don't know this right now, will sort of be a, be a, a metronome, will be an ever-present sort of tick-tock uh, uh, throughout my life. I might be the only almost 45-year-old who pays very close attention to the doomsday clock. Um, I will always know uh, throughout my life what time it is. Um, and not in the, like, Hamilton, what time is it kind of way. Um, <laughs> So in, in 1974, Nixon was president, right? He was uh, a, a nuclear hothead. He perfected the madman strategy of nuclear diplomacy. He once told a meeting of congressmen, I can go to my office, pick up the telephone, and in 25 minutes, millions of people will be dead. So this is the world that I was born into. But I was blissfully unaware, a happy, healthy baby, the first of three, born to parents who had set themselves on a course that, 
that perhaps should have precluded children of robust, muscular, creative, and risky anti-nuclear resistance. Uh, my uncle Dan Berrigan uh, wrote a series of poems uh, to welcome me into the world, and one uh, in part goes like this. You came from Harrisburg pit. You came from Custom House fire, uh, Custom House blood. You came from Catonsville fire. You came from jail. You came from a nun. You came from a priest. You came from a vow. Yes and no in the great Dow that creeps a vine claiming like two arms the world's rack for its own dismembering and flowering. And, uh, and if I could read at the time or understand any of those words, I might have just kind of, you know, wanted to disappear back up into the womb and, uh, you know, try again at some other, at some other time. Now, episode two, March 28th, uh, 1979. We're about to celebrate this anniversary uh, just, well, two days from now, right? Uh, three days before my fifth birthday, the Three Mile Island power plant, uh, power plant uh, suffers a partial meltdown. And as, a, as an almost five-year-old, I hear that word and, and I see the terror that it uh, provokes, uh, but it, it is a long time before I really understand what that word means. But my parents know exactly what it means and take my little brother and I uh, to West Virginia and we stay there for the better part of two weeks. We uh, live 90, less than 90 miles from uh, Three Mile Island and, and right in the right in the downward kind of plume uh, uh, of the radiation. We return to a changed diet. Right? That's the kind of biggest thing that I can remember as a, as a small child. Miso in hot water for breakfast every morning. My mother had read uh, that, uh, that the healthcare workers in Hiroshima after the atomic bombing, US atomic bombing of 1945, drank this uh, fermented soybean paste uh, it strengthened their immune system, it cleansed radiation from their bodies, um, and, uh, and so there we were, drinking miso every morning. To the five-year-old palate, miso is <laughs> disgusting, right? But we drank it every morning for years. The truth is we, every morning, were served a cup of miso, and about, you know, Four out of five times, we figured out a way to dump it in the sink instead of actually throw it down our guzzles, but, or guzzle it, you know, throw it down. Um, mixing uh, miso with apple juice does not make it taste better. <laughs> Anybody was wondering? It doesn't, it doesn't help at all. So uh, in the aftermath of the Three Mile Island nuclear power plant uh, uh, fiasco, my parents start to look more deeply at the connections between nuclear weapons and nuclear power, right? and kind of link these two uh, struggles uh, in, in important ways. Uh, episode three, September 9th, 1980. At this point, I'm six years old, and my brother's five. Uh, my brother's name is Jerry, by the way. Uh, and uh, our father and seven others gain access uh, to General Electric's Nuclear Missile, uh, Nuclear Missile Reentry Division. Uh, it's a, a plant in King of Prussia, Pennsylvania. A few months earlier, the doomsday clock had been moved from nine to seven minutes to nuclear midnight, because in the, the words of the uh, bulletin scientists, the United States and the Soviet Union were behaving like nucleoholics, behaving like nucleoholics. Drunks who continue to insist that the drunk drink being consumed is positively the last one, uh, but who can always find an excuse for just one more. My dad and his friends hammer on two nose cones, pour blood, and, and read from a statement. And, and I'll read a little bit of it. We commit civil disobedience at General Electric because this genocidal entity is the fifth leading pr uh, producer of weaponry in the United States. To maintain this position, GE drains $3 million a day from the public treasury, an enormous larceny against the poor. We wish also to challenge the lethal lies spun by GE through its motto, we bring good things to life. And I can just hear the jingo in my <laughs> As manufacturers of the Mark 12A reentry vehicle, GE actually prepares to bring good things to death. 
This is a new kind of action, right? It's in the tradition of the Catonsville Nine, and three uh, of the eight were, were participants in that action. Uh, but it brings in uh, voices from the Hebrew scriptures uh, that call uh, anyone to, who's paying attention uh, to beat swords into plowshares, to beat spears into pruning hooks. Our dad wrote uh, around that time, we love our children and all children, and this is why we are in resistance, this is why we are in jail. We cannot abandon the children cannot render them to Caesar for our immunity and comfort. And that love for them and for the God who blessed us with them will enrich their lives. And so, so runs our hope. My brother and I are in first grade at the time. We had just started school like a couple days before. Um, we are in the same grade. He's uh, almost exactly a year younger than I am, but we start school at the same time. We both know how to read. We're sort of essentially twins, uh, treated like twins, Irish twins, as they say. Um, and, uh, and this perhaps was not the best time for us to start going to school with the, um, with the shadow of this action uh, kind of looming over us. Um, we're in a swirl of six-year-old politics uh, that we mostly don't understand. We're objects of fascination and mild derision uh, by our mostly African-American classmates. We are, in fact, the only white kids uh, in our class. And uh, that might have been OK, but we're also being regarded uh, with pity uh, by our teachers. They've been told what our father has done. They've read about it in the newspaper. And while they know the, the kind of outlines of the action and, and that he's basically a good person, they have less context for what he's done than we do at, at six, uh, five and six years old. Our father spends that Christmas uh, in jail. And just before the holiday, we go and visit him. And in the course of my, uh, the visit, my brother, uh, at five years old, says uh, this to him. He says, oh, thank you, Dad. You've given us the greatest Christmas present anyone could give. My father says, well, what are you talking about? Because uh, there are definitely there are no Christmas presents coming out of this uh, county jail where my father was. And my brother responds, your action, you were making peace, just as Jesus was in coming to us at Christmas. And, uh, and this, I, I only know this story because it becomes, you know, I, I don't have an independent memory of it, right? But it's one of those stories that gets told over and over. And it's used at various times to celebrate my, my brother's thoughtfulness, um, his sincerity, and, uh, and at other times, uh, to highlight uh, the long downward spiral that the two of us have been on uh, kind of ever since, uh, from that glorious apex of insight and righteousness that we found ourselves at at five and six. Um, our dad faces years in jail. And in a February jury trial, he's convicted of burglary, conspiracy, criminal mischief, and he's sentenced to five to 10 years in jail. Somewhere between the action, uh, his trial, and his conviction, my sister Kate is conceived. And the story goes that when my mom comes home from the doctor's appointment that pronounces her pregnant, she takes a little slug of scotch. Um, Liz McAllister turns 42 just uh, two weeks after my sister is born on uh, November 5th, 1981. At that time, the doomsday clock is at four minutes. Is that about right? Four minutes to nuclear midnight. Moved in January of 1981 in response to the flat unwillingness of either the United States or the Soviet Union to reject publicly and in all circumstances the threat of striking the other first. Both sides willfully delude themselves that a nuclear war can remain limited, that it can be, even be won. In, in 1980, both sides officially declared nuclear weapons thinkable. Episode, what is this, episode four, right? November 20th, 1983. And by that time, I am nine and my brother is eight. And our little sister, Kate, has just turned two. And as a general rule, we're not really permitted to watch television, the three of us. 
Uh, we can only watch the nightly news, and we live for those uh, commercials. And our father sits right there, and he turns the volume down for the commercials, but we can still kind of, we can still, we get the gist anyway, right? Um, so, uh, so we don't get to watch much TV, but on this random Sunday before Thanksgiving, we Berrigan children, we older ones, get a special treat. And we're allowed to watch a television movie with our parents. Oh my god, so exciting. Uh, the movie is called The Day After. Oh. Right? Perhaps you guys have watched this. You all, you all watched this movie. Uh, more than 35 years later, before I you know, looked it up on Wikipedia, uh, the details of the film were vague. But the outline is clear, right? The film imagines a nuclear attack on the United States and the lives of people lucky enough, unlucky enough uh, to be survivors uh, of those attacks. After the film, we sat with our parents and our mom told us uh, that she was gonna do an action soon and that uh, uh, her action was aimed at keeping what the film depicted uh, from happening. She later wrote about this conversation our children have grown up with these nuclear realities as part of the air they breathe. They've seen many people in the community in which we live, including their mom and dad, imprisoned for resistance to nuclear abolition. But to have mom do something like this and face her possible absence. What's up, New London? Hi. Hey. Sorry. What? No problem. Big accident when I Yeah. yeah. Mm. And so I start over. I go back to the beginning. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah, no problem. There's a tape, Bob. We can watch the tape. Um, where was I? Just my, my inner shtick coming out. Um, oh, yeah, so, uh, so my mom is, is talking about uh, this conversation that we have. But to have mom do something like this and face her possible absence, uh, absence from our day-to-day -day lives uh, for an indefinite period of time, this was a large step. She continues, they were willing to accept the personal ex uh, sacrifice of my absence as their part in trying to stop nuclear war from happening, as their part in trying to avoid the suffering that the, mu uh, that the movie displayed. It was a moment of extreme clo closeness for the four of us, a moment of accepting together uh, whatever might come. And we concluded our conversation with prayer and big, big hugs. 35 years later, reconsidering this story as a, as a parent myself, parent of three, it strikes me as a very calculated move. It strikes me as a mom power play to show us this movie and uh, engage in this com uh, conversation. Uh, President Ronald uh, Reagan watched uh, the day after uh, two. He watched it a few weeks before it hit television screens and he wrote in his diary that the film was very effective and left me uh, greatly depressed. It must not have stuck uh, his, uh, his depression because less than a year later, you know, we, we all heard him joking, right, that bombing begins in, in five minutes. Nearly 100 million people watched the day after on its first broadcast. Uh, back, in those, back in those days where we all sat down and we watched the same show at the same time. 100 million people, it was a record uh, for um, a made-for-television movie. But very few uh, followed up uh, that night of, uh, of terror and uh, dislocation uh, with an action uh, like our mom's. So November 24th, uh, 1983, four days later, uh, my mom is one of seven who enter Griffiths Air Force Base in upstate New York in the early hours of the morning and hammered and poured blood on a B-52 bomber. We were in Syracuse uh, at the time with my dad's brother and his family uh, when it happens or there to celebrate Thanksgiving. It took hours for base security to learn uh, of the breach and, and to arrest them. Uh, in fact, they had to call. They found a phone inside of one of the air uh, hangers and uh, called the operator. Hello. Um, uh, they're initially charged with sabotage, conspiracy, destruction of government property, and they face 25 years in jail. We are, as I said, nine, eight, and two. They're eventually tried in federal court in Syracuse, 
And I remember their trial as a strange mixture of freedom and scrutiny for my brother and sister and I. Our mom and dad are caught up in the trial. Um, you know, there's lots of people for them to talk to, there's lots for them to do, and we're left to play and grapple largely unsupervised, kind of with a, a couple other a little posse of uh, activist kids. But we're also in the media eye, so somebody is kind of watching us all the time. And uh, People Magazine called us troopers to the extreme uh, when they covered mom's sentencing in July of 1984. Our dad tells this same reporter, they don't cry. They've been raised in a resistance community. They've seen their mother and father repeatedly brought to jail for nonviolent civil disobedience. And we did cry, um, but uh, the reporter didn't see it. And most often than not, uh, our dad didn't see it either. Um, our mom ends up serving 26 months, a little bit more than two years, in Alderson uh, Federal Prison in West Virginia. And we fall into a rhythm of traveling there once a month for a long weekend. The powers that be conspire that, uh, that each one of those weekends where we miss a Friday at school is a, is a field trip uh, for our whole class. Uh, they go to Hershey Park, uh, they go to Six Flags, um, they go on nature adventures. Honest to God, every single time we leave, they do something really fun. Um, and uh, uh, every month my father writes a long excuse my children from school letter, uh, like we all do. Uh, but in these letters he uh, reminds uh, our teachers that our mom is in jail for her anti-nuclear action. And he sees this as an opportunity for education, right, to, to just kind of continue uh, the, the learning process. Um, we bypass this impulse. We figure out a way to relate exclusively with the school secretary for these early dismissals on these fraught Fridays, as we come to call them. And we're not the only kids with moms in jail uh, in our school, but we are certainly the only ones whose dad writes a polemic, a monthly polemic about it. These uh, early actions and our participation in them as extreme troopers is, uh, is happening at a high point of anti-nuclear uh, opinion and activity in the United States uh, and throughout the world. Right? So going back a little bit, we have 2,000 clamshell protesters in, in, at the Seabrook, Seabrook uh, nuclear power plant in May of 1977, 1,400 of whom are arrested and held in jails and National Guard armories for up to two weeks. And Joanne Sheehan, uh, who is my mother-in-law and activist with uh, War Resisters League, is instrumental uh, in this series of actions and the jail, jail solidarity that follows. June 1982, more than a million people and perhaps everybody in this room uh, uh, crammed Central Park for a demonstration against nuclear weapons. And then uh, in the days that followed, the, nuclear, uh, the, the War Resisters League organizes blockades at each of the uh, missions uh, of the nuclear weapon states. Um, and more than 1,000 people are arrested. And uh, you know, just a badge of pride uh, to some of them that they are arrested at more than one uh, of the missions. And I think, Joanne, correct me if I'm wrong, that a couple people were able to get all five, right? Yep. Hardcore, right? And uh, in uh, April uh, 1983, uh, there's a, a human chain 14 miles long, 70,000 people uh, in, uh, in the United Kingdom uh, against uh, nuclear weapons and US uh, targeted missiles uh, being on British soil. And the women of Greenham Common uh, are there you know, for 19 years, right? Now holding down uh, that resistance uh, for 19 years until the camp is officially disbanded in the year 2000. So this opposition to nuclear weapons is both broad and deep, right? The nuclear freeze campaign uh, delivers uh, signatures uh, to the US and Soviet missions, uh, to the United Nations, and there are 2.3 million people, 2.3 of you and I, who signed those uh, petitions. And a referendum that followed uh, was on the ballots in 10 states, in Washington, D.C., in 37 cities and uh, counties uh, around the nation. Um, and at the time uh, of the election, 
The freeze referendum was the largest on a single issue in US history up until that point, right? So there's just, there's, you know, people are talking about it, they're thinking about it, uh, they're, they're motivated to action around it. I'm sure that every one of you can flip back through your own consciousness uh, and find one of these activist happenings, or, or perhaps all of them, and many others uh, that you participated in. Times you felt powerful and unified and sure, sure, or at least incredibly hopeful that we were right at a tipping point, right at a tipping point towards nuclear disarmament. We worked so hard uh, for uh, nuclear abolition, and, and we still, and we're still doing that work. I'm trying to keep track of my time a little bit here, so I don't put you all to sleep. Uh, five more times throughout his life, my fa father carried out Plasher's actions, and he helped to organize and support countless others. Um, and I can talk about uh, those more in the Q and A. Um, if you want, I'm going to just kind of skip ahead a little bit here um, and go to the the last one uh, that he participated in. Uh, so December 19th, uh, 1999, uh, plowshares versus depleted uranium. Uh, in that action, uh, the group uh, cut through a fence at the Air National Guard base in Essex, Maryland. Uh, they poured blood, hung a rosary and a banner, and hammered on two A-10 Warthog bombers. All were charged with malicious destruction of property and conspiracy. Um, and, and by that point, uh, I, I'm out of college. I'm a, I'm a full-on grown-up uh, living in uh, New York City. I have an apartment in Brooklyn and a, uh, a job at the New School for Social Research, where I, I work as an arms. Uh, I work for uh, an arms analyst and a public intellectual by the name of Bill Hartung who runs a little project called the Armed Security Initiative at the time. And I feel incredibly lucky uh, to have a job like this and, uh, and very uncomfortable uh, with my good fortune. And I was grateful uh, around that time to find the War Resisters League as a young adult and, and start working with them. And I always thought of it as a sort of, um, like, not that I was like a Wall Street trader or anything, but that uh, just the idea of being able to make a living uh, doing this kind of work, um, I, I felt like I was kind of carbon trading a little bit and by spending all of my uh, weekends and free time uh, with the War Resisters League. So at that time, I, I know all about depleted uranium, right? The radioactive byproduct uh, that's being used as a, as a covering and, and sometimes also a ballast inside of munitions to give them armor busting capabilities. And I know all about the, the, the way, in that, uh, way in which that diffuses uh, and par particularizes um, and, uh, and, and goes throughout the environment. Some of my favorite times with my dad uh, are reading, um, are kind of trading bad news stories. You know, oh, did you hear about the cluster bombs that are being used here? Oh, yeah, no, you know, you're paying attention to the way that this is not how any of us talk, but it's just fun to do these voices. Oh, you know, the army's trying to control the weather, and uh, you know, right? as we go like back and forth, we're reading the same stuff, and we're, we're trying to shock each other, and we're like two old men instead of just one old man, and um, uh, we, we uh, like doing that. He's reading and enjoying the articles that I'm writing and publishing, and he occasionally enjoins me not to have such a secular voice. He says, gosh, Frida, this is good. This is good stuff, but, you know, it sounds very secular. It's very cut and dry. You know, you should just, just try quoting Jesus in that article for uh, the progressive. Why don't you? Uh, you know, in, in these times, I think, you know, they're so, so left, so left. And, uh, you know, Gandhi, put a little Gandhi quote into that article. And I'm like, mm, that's okay. I wanted to get published, Dad. Um, I, I need that $75 that they're going to send me. Um, so, uh, so, but, you know, as we're talking all about depleted uranium, and I can kind of read the signs, right? Like, what's going on? How come my dad's so interested in this? How come all of our conversations are kind of, you know, coalescing around DU? And... Uh, I take the train down uh, from New York and I ask him not to do the action. I say, please don't do this. Uh, you're kind of getting a little old. 
And, uh, and so uh, he, I did not offer to take his place. He did not ask me to. Um, and, uh, and we kind of, you know, he, it was a, uh, it was a really lovely uh, conversation in the end. Uh, he wrote in a statement before the action, um, and he could have been talking to me. I'm uh, 76 years old, a married Catholic priest with 35 years of resistance to empire's wars, nine years of imprisonment, numberless arrests, surveillance and dirty tricks from the FBI, and enter my friends, sometimes brusquely, hey dads, give it up to the young pups, it's rocking chair time. But, 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 I cannot forget the dying children of Iraq, uh, the two million Iraqis dead from our war, sanctions, and depleted uranium. I cannot forget my country's war psychosis, its obsession with better tools for killing, its mammoth war chest, its think tanks, and war labs. My dad is sentenced to 30 months in jail, uh, and my mom says uh, to supporters outside uh, at the sentencing, they were prepared for the worst, and they got it. He served some of his sentence at a youth facility in rural Maryland. I guess all the grown-up jails were full. And uh, he is often, you know, obviously the oldest person uh, in the visiting room. He is also the only uh, white person uh, in, you know, uh, in prison there. And also uh, all the people who are uh, the COs and the guards are all African American as well. The visiting room is designed, designed for discomfort and has this chest level barrier all around uh, between the inmates, inmates and the visitors. And uh, you couldn't put your knees under it because you couldn't be face to face. Um, and you couldn't touch it. And so you sort of kind of have to lean to the side and kind of visit like this, um, which was uh, no fun. But uh, the visits were only about 25 minutes long. And so you sort of accommodated to it. It was brutally loud. The young men in there all called him Pops, uh, which made me remember my own uh, campaign to call him Pops uh, when I was a teenager. Uh, he shut it down hard and fast, and uh, then I understood why. Right? There are only one group of people who get to call Philip Berrigan Pops, and uh, there are other inmates uh, who are incarcerated with him. Uh, they showed him concern and respect uh, at all times, and that was the word we got uh, even when it wasn't visiting time. He was released right before Christmas of 2001, and his friends welcomed him back to minimum security. Hey, Phil, welcome back to minimum security. Get it? You guys get it? Yeah. He died less than a year later, on December 6, 2002. The Bulletin of the Atomic Scientist Doomsday Clock uh, stood at seven minutes to nuclear midnight. Uh, and that was the same time as when it was created, all the way back in 1947. In the wake of September 11th, 2001, the scientists wrote, moving the clock's hands at this time reflects our growing concern that the international community has hit the snooze button instead of responding to the alarm. There are more than 31,000 nuclear weapons uh, still maintained by the eight known nuclear powers. I think at that point, North Korea might not have uh, been uh, a known nuclear power. A decrease of only 30,000, uh, 3,000, excuse me, since 1998. Over the next decade and a half, excuse me, our mom continues to live in the community that she formed with my dad and others, continues to bear witness at the Pentagon, the White House, other sites of power. She keeps animals, uh, this is since my father died, uh, goats, llamas, donkeys, uh, even a sheep. She starts painting again. Uh, she's arrested repeatedly, but not in any big uh, uh, actions. Um, I myself uh, leave New York City uh, and settle in a, a small town in eastern Connecticut, New London. Uh, I get married, I have three kids. Uh, I, uh, I moved to, uh, you know, from New York City, big, big city, uh, to New London, Connecticut, uh, the home of General Dynamics, right, which uh, runs Electric Boat, uh, a major nuclear submarine builder um, that's right across the harbor from us. We see it, and we are essentially a company town 
uh, for the military industrial complex with all the, the problems that you uh, know come along with that. My brother and sister uh, settled down too. My brother uh, uh, helped to form a Catholic worker community in Michigan uh, with his wife and another couple. They have three kids. Uh, my sister is a physical therapist and, and an activist um, in Grand Rapids. Um, we're all uh, arrested occasionally. We march, we organize, we speak, we try. As our mother approaches and passes 70, we, like lots of other people our age, uh, start encouraging her to take it easy. Right? We didn't learn our lesson with our dad, so we tried again with our mom. And since she's 14 years younger, we have a whole other, like, go at it, right? Um, we start encouraging her to take it easy. Give up the rigors of community life and resistance. Give up the constant hosting and constant demonstrating. We envision uh, and invite her into a life uh, with her grandchildren, a life of reading stories and participating at bedtimes, art projects, sporting events. She goes, and uh, those of you who know Elizabeth McAllister are not surprised by this, and we weren't really either, she goes in the exact opposite direction. While others are taking the reins at Jonah House, uh, she feels free for the first time since our father's death to be a plowshares activist again, to conspire with her friends and to, uh, and to plan for a rigorous and daring action. We don't know the specifics, uh, but as all of her answers about the future muddle into a very specific kind of vagueness, uh, we know exactly what's going on. Please don't, we say, you're too old, we say, we make our sister say that one. Think of your grandkids, we say, I will, she says, I'm not, she says, and I am, she says. This is what I have to give. I turned uh, 44 last April 1st. Um, it was also Easter. Um, in the longer version of my talk, uh, where I talk about the five plowshares actions that my dad uh, did, but between the time when we were little and we were adults, um, half of them end up being on Easter, uh, which often coincides with my birthday. Uh, so my birthday is all tied up in this plowshares, dad going to jail thing. But here we are, uh, uh, April 1st, uh, 19, uh, 2018 was Easter again, and a few days later we received word of a new plowshares action. April 4th, 2018. Seven Catholic pla uh, plowshares activists enter the Kings Bay Naval Submarine Base in St. Mary's, Georgia. They went to make real the prophet Isaiah's command to beat swords into plowshares. They chose to act on the 50th anniversary of the assassination of uh, Dr. King and carrying hammers and baby blood, uh, ba carrying hammers and baby bottles of their own blood. It's like a funny uh, tongue twister, the seven attempted to convert weapons of mass destruction. They hoped to call attention to the ways in which nuclear weapons kill every day by their mere existence and maintenance. Uh, they were charged with three federal felonies, one misdemeanor, uh, and if convicted on all counts, uh, they could face 25 years in prison. And, uh, and three of them are still uh, in county uh, jails. And, and uh, Stephen Cobesa will talk more about this. Uh, but my mom, Liz McAllister, Father Steve Kelly, who's a Jesuit priest, and Mark Koval, who's part of the uh, New, New Haven uh, Catholic Worker Community, the Amistad Catholic Worker Community, uh, have uh, are remaining in county jail. And the other four, are um, out on bond wearing ankle monitors and required, uh, required to check in with their minders at regular intervals. The Kings Bay Naval uh, Station is home to six uh, nuclear ballistic submarines, uh, each of which carries 20 uh, Trident missiles. Right? Uh, every su submarine carries the potential for thousands of Hiroshima's. My mother, uh, who celebrated her 79th birthday in November uh, in the uh, uh, Brunswick uh, County Jail, uh, feels very useful there. She feels very useful there. She's generous, empathetic, and calm in a place that encourages none of those qualities. 
The wheels of justice grind very slowly in Georgia, particularly because the activists are mounting a creative legal defense. They seek to portray their actions as protected under the freedom of religion uh, using Religious Freedom Restoration Act. Um, and this is, a, a, it's called RIFRA, which is fun to say. Uh, uh, this, is, uh, this law um, allowed the homophobic cake makers to refuse uh, to make cake uh, for uh, a, a gay uh, couple's wedding, right? They're seeking to demonstrate that their deeply held religious beliefs uh, and their practice of religion is burdened uh, by, uh, by nuclear weapons and by uh, first strike, um, by the doomsday clock, by all of these things. So please keep them in, in thought and prayer. And uh, Stephen uh, Kweza has some, uh, can share some specific ways uh, that you can be helpful in uh, supporting and drawing attention to their case. Just a few months before they acted, the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists moved the clock again and this time we're two minutes, two minutes to nuclear midnight. This is a dangerous time, they, they write, but the danger is of our own making. The danger is of our own making. Humankind has invented the implements of apocalypse and so can invent the methods of controlling and eventually eliminating, it, eliminating them. The clock has never been closer to nuclear midnight in my lifetime. In fact, it's the closest it's been since 1953. All that work, all of this sacrifice, and the clock keeps moving closer to midnight. Their action and in st extended incarceration pretrial comes as nuclear conflagration seems more likely, and nuclear weapons do not even rate on the list of top 10 fears that Americans are questioned about every year. I would love to kind of do this poll, by the way, 1,900 uh, people. Uh, polled about what they're most fearful about. So uh, corrupt politicians not having enough money, uh, high medical bills, those are all legit concerns, uh, but those uh, all rate much higher on the list of uh, uh, concerns uh, than nuclear weapons. Putin and Trump have shredded uh, the imperfect, imbalanced, but important fabric of nuclear arms control treaties. And uh, Putin claims at this point that Russia is developing a new class of invincible, invincible nuclear weapons. The Pentagon has signaled recently that the United States will begin testing uh, new types of, of missiles. And just to make things uh, even more, just to pour a little bit more uh, terror salt onto this brew, uh, uh, the Center for Strategic and International Studies recently said that China is improving uh, its own nuclear arsenal in response to this uh, new hot war dance or, or new cold war. So, you know, there's some kind of clever phrase there. But. Searching for signs of hope to counter uh, uh, um, this, uh, looking for a bulwark against these mounting fears, I, uh, I hold close the, um, uh, the work of the international campaign to abolish nuclear weapons. Uh, and the work that um, uh, the ban is doing here in this country. Right? I draw hope from that movement uh, and from this new international consensus uh, developing outside uh, of official institutions, outside um, of all of these compromised um, and uh, ineffective institutions. We need all the hope uh, we can get. So in conclusions, nuclear weapons uh, ruined my life, but, uh, but not uh, in the way that you might think. Not in the way that you might think. I actually went through, I went up into the attic and looked through all my old journals from high school and college uh, preparing for this talk. And I was looking for hard evidence of, the, of my sadness and uh, ennui. Uh, my angst uh, af uh, around um, all of these comings and goings, these leavings uh, uh, for uh, off to prison, all my birthdays ruined, ruined, I tell you. Um, and I didn't find it. Right? I talk about all of these episodes uh, in my journals, uh, but I am not, uh, you know, in the moment, I am not devastated by it, right? I am not mourning and bemoaning uh, all of this. So nuclear weapons ruined a particular kind of life for me, right? The life of a nuclear family, the life of keeping up 
with the Joneses, the life of striving and grasping and ambition-sizing, a life of individual achievement. Uh, achievement. You heard it here first, folks. <laughs> achievement. Um, achievement. Uh, so ruined all of that, wiped all of that away, and I'm extremely grateful for that. <clears throat> And yet, nuclear weapons, and, and as I said at the beginning, the doomsday clock um, are just sort of tick-tocking uh, through, uh, through everything. They're present in all of my major relationships. Uh, every goodbye and hello is, is freighted with a small frisson uh, of uncertainty. And that has been the case since I was a small child. Nuclear weapons have, thought, have shaped how I think about time. Right? Uh, Jonathan Shell wrote uh, that incredible book, uh, a gift of time. We were given the gift of time uh, at the end of the Cold War that we, uh, at least we in the, the West and the North, uh, managed to emerge somewhat unscathed and had been given the gift of time. And, and I think now, well, you know, what have we done with this gift of time since uh, the end of the Cold War all those years ago? So nuclear weapons have caused me to honor and uh, treasure the present. Uh, they've made the future provisional and muted and not to be taken uh, for granted. I try and be present uh, to the present and to hold and to hold the future loosely, hold the future loosely, but with hope. Nuclear weapons ruined my life and I wouldn't have it any other way. In fact, I hope they're ruining your life too because that's the only way, that's the only way we're going to get rid of them. Thank you. <laughs>